Welcome back. In this short lesson, we are going to look at uh, how we can overcome a certain problem when uh, analyzing fuel cycles uh, by Monte Carlo burn-up simulations. A fuel cycle is a time period during which a nuclear reactor operates with the same uh, configuration of the fuel assemblies. So once the fuel assemblies are loaded into the active core of the nuclear reactor, the nuclear reactor can start its operation. It takes typically about a year, uh, after which the reactor is shut down. Some part of the fuel assemblies is removed. Uh, new assemblies are loaded inside the active core. The configuration of the fuel assemblies is changed so that uh, the distribution of the power is optimized. So our objective here is the simulation of the fuel depletion in all the different fuel assemblies in the active core during the whole fuel cycle. The simulation of the fuel cycles is probably the most common application to Monte Carlo burn-up codes. Now the simulation of the fuel cycles is not exactly a trivial task and this is especially true for uh, uh, cycle simulations in thermal reactors in which uh, we fight with the so-called xenon oscillations. Xenon oscillations represent a serious problem in uh, large thermal reactors because they uh, cause the oscillations of the power distribution. So the power distribution oscillates out of phase with the xenon distribution and that can represent a safety problem. So therefore during the nuclear reactor operation uh, the xenon oscillations are uh, damped down by the active control system. So the control rods are uh, used in different positions to uh, fight with the xenon oscillations and they are pretty effective and the xenon oscillations can be managed. I will explain on the next slide the reason why the xenon oscillation can develop during the real uh, operation of nuclear reactors. Nevertheless uh, it should be clear to us that we do not want to see any oscillations of the power distribution or xenon distribution in our Monte Carlo burn-up simulations. That's not because they are not real, they are real, nevertheless they are damped down during the operation of the nuclear reactor. So the operators in the control rooms, when they see that the xenon oscillation starts to develop, they use control rods to damp down the oscillation. However, that would not be very practical for us to program some special logic into the burn-up simulator that would control the position of control rods in different positions in the active core in order to stabilize the xenon oscillation. Uh, so instead what we do, we treat Xenon 135 in some uh, special way. I'm going to explain it later. And we use the stable numerical coupling schemes. When we couple the Monte Carlo solver with the burn up solver, we have to use stable coupling schemes. I'm going to talk about the stability of different coupling schemes in. Uh, the next lessons. Uh, I will show you some uh, unstable coupling schemes as well as stable coupling schemes. They all are being used in uh, many Monte Carlo burn-up codes, so uh, you always need to make sure that you are using the appropriate coupling scheme for your simulation. In order to understand the xenon oscillations 
we need to understand how xenon 135 can be generated in the nuclear reactor and how it can be destroyed so xenon 135 can be created directly from fission as a fission product but uh, most of xenon 135 comes from iodine 135 which decays into xenon 135 the half-life of this decay is about uh, six and a half hour and the iodine 135 originates also from fission actually decays from uh, another fission product but this decay is very fast so we can just assume that it comes directly from fission now xenon 135 can be depleted also in the core uh, by its decay so it can decay uh, with the half-life of about nine hours uh, but it also uh, can be removed from the system by transmutation so it can capture neutrons and it will be transmuted the microscopic cross-section of xenon 135 for uh, the capture of neutrons is very large so uh, when the atomic concentration of xenon 135 uh, increases in the reactor it can really affect the power distribution in the core so because the neutrons are captured in uh, xenon 135 during the operation the power typically shifts to the locations in which the concentration of xenon 135 is smallest in the system so let's say that uh, our system is a slab uh, reactor and let's say that the concentration of uh, xenon 135 is asymmetric there uh, let's say that it looks like this for instance so because of this the power will shift to the left side of the system so the power distribution may look something like this right now because of this the xenon in this part of the system will start to be depleted faster than here and that's because of the large microscopic cross-section for the neutron capture on xenon so it will uh, start to decrease the concentration of xenon will start to drop however at the same time the iodine 135 will uh, start to be generated at larger rate at this location where the power is released the most so after some time the distribution of iodine 135 will start to look like this as well now the cross-section of iodine 135 for the neutron capture is very small nevertheless the iodine is decaying into xenon 135 therefore the concentration of xenon 135 in this location will start start to increase uh, so hour by hour the concentration of xenon 135 will grow while in this location will uh, decrease why because it decays with the half-life of nine hours and uh, not much xenon is being generated here because the concentration of iodine is very small so after some time the situation will change a lot the concentration of xenon 135 will start to look like this and as a response to that the power distribution will change into this shape now the same processes will cause that the power distribution will come back to this uh, shape again so uh, the oscillation will sustain 
and the period of this oscillation is about 15 hours. The external oscillation can be stabilized by using control rods. So, for instance, when you load the control rods into the location of the highest power, then uh, the power will flatten out. So it, it will become symmetrical in the reactor and this will effectively stop the xenon oscillation. Xenon oscillations can develop only in uh, thermal systems. So uh, if you simulate the fuel cycles in uh, fast reactors, you don't have to worry about uh, xenon oscillations at all. So unless we employ some special procedures to stabilize the xenon oscillations in our burn-up simulations, there will be always a risk that they will develop. And uh, that may be the aim of your uh, simulation. Maybe you want to simulate xenon oscillations. So in this case, you of course do not want to stabilize it artificially. But that, I guess, is a very special case. Most of the time we are going to uh, want to simulate the fuel cycles under steady state conditions, when there are no xenon oscillations in the systems. Now there is a question. If we do not artificially stabilize the xenon distribution in the system, will the xenon oscillation always develop? Not necessarily. It depends on a number of factors. It depends on the system that we are simulating. Uh, so, for instance, if there is only a single fuel material defined in the system, then uh, there is no way uh, in which the xenon could change its spatial distribution, because there is just one uh, uh, material defined in the input file. Now, when you define a single fuel material in the system, well, then probably your system is very small. So it's probably a small fragment of a fuel assembly. Probably it's uh, just a small piece of a single fuel rod. So then you don't need to specify many fuel materials in the input file. And uh, of course, nothing can oscillate in such a small system. So then you don't need to worry. Uh, another possibility is that the system that you model represents a fast system. So as we already know, uh, there are no xenon oscillations in the fast systems. So if you run a Monte Carlo burn-up simulation of a fast system, you don't have to worry about xenon oscillations either, and you can employ any coupling schemes which you like. And the last possibility, when uh, xenon oscillations do not develop in a system, is when the system is very small. When it has a small dominance ratio, then uh, typically xenon oscillations do not develop there either. So in this case, you also can employ any coupling scheme in your Monte Carlo burn-up simulation. If we want to simulate the fuel cycles in large thermal systems realistically, we have to introduce thousands of fuel materials in the input file. And that's because there are hundreds of fuel assemblies in the core and the fuel in each assembly depletes differently in different locations. That's because the power is different in different positions in the reactor, not only radially, but also axially. So typically we need to introduce different uh, uh, zones axially. For instance, we can introduce 10 uh, zones uh, axially in, the, in each fuel assembly, and we can introduce uh, a unique fuel material in each uh, fuel zone, so that we allow for uh, different fuel depletion in different axial position in each assembly. So we really may have uh, many thousands of different fuel materials specified in the input file that we use for the Monte Carlo burn-up simulation. So uh, 
under these conditions, we know that uh, we may expect development of a large xenon oscillation. Now, how do we deal with this problem? How can we possibly stabilize the xenon oscillation in such a simulation? There are several possible solutions to this problem. One of the solutions is to make a small uh, modification to the burn-up solver. And the modification is in the way how the Xenon 135 uh, is treated. So uh, we can demand that the burn-up solver will uh, always calculate the so-called saturated concentration for Xenon 135. So what does it mean? Normally the burn-up solver would consider the time step uh, when it calculates the concentration of Xenon 135. So uh, if the time step was very short, for instance um, several minutes, then uh, Xenon 135 would practically be identical to the initial condition, right? So if we specified a certain concentration of Xenon 135, then the concentration would be practically unchanged after several minutes. However, when we calculate the so-called saturated concentration for uh, Xenon 135, it means that the time step is not considered uh, and it, instead the concentration is calculated for the infinite time step. Let me demonstrate this on a plot. So uh, let's have time here and the concentration of Xenon 135. So let's assume that this is the concentration of xenon at some specific position in the reactor. And let's assume that at time uh, zero there is no xenon. And let's assume that the neutron flux is uh, constant in that position. So over time the concentration of xenon 135 will uh, start to grow. Um, partly because it will be generated directly from fission, but uh, mainly because the concentration of iodine-135 will increase. Uh, so it will grow, but then it will stabilize at some point. So at this point there will be balance between the rate at which the xenon-135 is being generated by uh, primarily decay from iodine-35 and the decay rate for uh, xenon-135 and the rate at which the xenon is uh, being transmuted by the neutron capture. So this would be the saturated uh, concentration of xenon-135. It is dependent on the neutron flux value. So when uh, the neutron flux is increased, the saturated concentration of xenon 135 is increased as well. It's, it's approximately proportional until a certain level. Let's take an example of a slab reactor. Let's say that the power distribution is like this, symmetrical. So then uh, if we calculated the saturated uh, xenon concentration in the whole space of this uh, slab, then it will be proportional, approximately proportional to the power distribution. So it would look like this uh, as well. It would have the same shape. Now the burn-up solver must consider the time step length when it calculates the atomic concentrations for different nuclides. So if the time step is like this, then the concentration for uh, xenon 135 that it would calculate would be here. So the modification we do to the burn-up solver is that we let it to calculate the 
concentrations of all the nuclides according to the correct time step. The only exception is the concentration of xenon 135, where we are going to demand that uh, it does not consider the time step at all and instead it always calculates the saturated concentration of xenon 135. So it will always return the uh, saturated uh, distribution for xenon 135 which would be similar to the power distribution. Unfortunately, this single change to the burn-up solver is not enough to stabilize the burn-up simulations. We also have to make sure that we are using numerically stable coupling schemes when we couple the Monte Carlo solver to the fuel depletion solver. Usually the established Monte Carlo burn-up codes give uh, the user an option to choose from uh, several different uh, coupling schemes between the Monte Carlo and the burn-up solver. And some of these uh, coupling schemes are not necessarily numerically stable. So in the next lessons I'm going to go through a number of uh, different coupling schemes and we are going to analyze the stability. Now, although the Xenon-135 is the largest contributor to the possible numerical instability of Monte Carlo burn-up simulations, it is not the only cause uh, of the instabilities. There are other nuclides that may contribute, some of the fission products, which also have uh, large cross-sections for uh, neutron capture, uh, may be causing uh, instabilities as well. And even uh, the fissile nuclides can uh, contribute to instabilities. So this is especially when you set a very large time step. You may deplete the fissile nuclides uh, differently in different locations and consequently the power distribution will be changing according to that. So uh, in order to avoid the problems of this type, we have to always make sure that the time step is sufficiently short. And that is all. Have a nice day.